Okay, so first by way of introductions, my name is Jeff Anderson. Uh, I am one of the lawyers for this courageous survivor, Troy Bramlage, B-R-A-M-L-A-G-E, formerly known as John Doe II. To his left is my co-counsel, Mike Bryant, and uh, together we had the privilege and do have the privilege of working with him, that is Troy, in having brought a case against St. John's uh, two years ago that came up for trial uh, in May of uh, this last year and uh, shortly before trial settled that case. And we settled the case um, with the insistence, uh, Troy's insistence, that uh, we do everything possible to make sure that all the secrets in all the files of all the offenders known to St. John's and credibly accused of having abused minors be released to us as a part of that settlement. And they did. And since that time, we have now been taking those files, I think there are 32 of them, and uh, calling through them to take out victims' names, survivors' names, and identifying information. Today we are here uh, to release five of those files. And we have selected these five because they have, they have been redacted, but also they reflect to us and in themselves the reality that there are dozens and hundreds of survivors even reflected in these files that are yet to be known and yet to maybe even have a voice. And so we're going to walk through some of these files and what they show about the numbers of survivors and numbers of victims and numbers of kids who were failed to be protected over the years. Uh, and also want to deliver the important message that there still is time for survivors in Minnesota under the Child Victims Act, a window. And that time is now six months, and so the clock is ticking. And before I go through what some of these files reflect about how many potential survivors and victims there are just in the files of the five offenders who we're releasing today, who are Richard Eckroth, Thomas Gillespie, Fran Hefkin, Finian McDonald, and Bruce Wolmering. Those five offender files alone, before we discuss those, they're reflective of potentially how many kids, how many young people, how many people have been harmed who have yet to know that they're not alone who have yet to know that the law can give them a chance to do something and do it privately the same way Troy Bramlett chose to do it when he filed suit as John Doe II. John Doe II is now here with us and his name is Troy Bramlett. And before I go into some of the files and Mike and I speak to what we think it is significant, I think it's really important to hear from you, Troy, about how you're feeling today and what brings you back um, uh, with us today? Um, got a lot of mixed emotions for coming back. Uh, the first one is uh, we still need to get our voices out to people that have not come forward. So again, tell somebody, you know, talk to a therapist, talk to your, your friends, whatever it takes to get it out because you don't want to suffer alone and you're not. There are a lot of people around me that have, have helped an awful lot to remind me that this is something that happens and we get to feel guilty 
about it. And because of that, a lot of times we don't step forward because we don't want to be vulnerable. The reason I chose to use my name, you guys probably heard this from me three or four times, is I wanted to at least come out and say, this happens, it's real, I'm one of those people, use my face, come forward, be John Doe 10, it doesn't matter, come out, let your story be told. The other thing I'm a little concerned about is uh, there was a press release, uh, a pre-press release from St. John's, I don't know if you guys have that or not, but uh, I'll talk about that more. I, I'll let these guys talk first and I'll tell you what, my personal opinion of the fire that was coming out of my eyes after I read it. So. Uh, Troy, first I think we need to applaud you for your courage and being willing to uh, put a face and uh, to your voice and demanding that this, uh, this release uh, be made. It is important, it is valuable, and in some ways it is historic. Uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, to be done. I think it's also important to name your offender and your offender was Alan Tarleton who raped you as a youth, correct? That is correct. And uh, that is a name that has been known and made public before that needs to be repeated because there are a number of survivors who have come forward of Al Alan Tarleton and others. Um, because Troy chose to come forward as a John Doe and make his truth known and shared. Uh, I think some of the things that these files help us um, uh, understand a little better and alarm us as the time is running out on the window is that uh, so many kids were um, allowed, or so many offenders, and these files alone were allowed access to so many kids for so many years. And, um, and why we're here is because we're so concerned about so many other survivors and victims out there. And what these files begin to show us that I'm going to highlight first um, when it comes to Finney and McDonald. Finney and McDonald, right here, um, was a counselor uh, at St. John's. And I think uh, he, there were four counselors at St. John's. Three of the four counselors are offenders. Finney and McDonald, uh, Anthony Tabor, and Bruce Wolmering. Bruce Wolmering, right here, and Finian McDonald, our files are being released today. There are the four counselors, three of those four counselors, those counseling the students, the minors, and the college students, are themselves offenders. What's significant about Fiddy and McDonald's file, when we look at that, is he was a counselor for 20 years there and admits using counseling to abuse students. That he had access to students with complaints to St. John's through at least 2011. 2011. that he admits in the file attraction to boys as young as 12 with no ability to control his sexual impulses. He also admits as a part of his inability to control sexual impulses to having 200 sexual partners. Bruce Wolmering. Bruce Wolmering, right here, is also a counselor. 
minors at, at this preparatory school and students at the university. The file reflects that he was a counselor for over 30 years. And the file, his file, reflects that he gravitated towards younger people throughout his career. It also shows that he was diagnosed with compulsive and exploitive sexual disorder in 2003 and deemed to still be at least a moderate risk. He admits in the file to having had something like 300 sexual partners many, uh, if not most, may be adults, but we know some were not. How many? We do not know. The file of Fran Hefkin, right here, Fran Hefkin. Uh, Fran Hefkin was arrested in Stearns County uh, in 1984 for a criminal sexual conduct against a child. The file shows that he was allowed to continue in ministry until the 1990s. That arrest was made known to the Abbey. Even though he was not prosecuted, he was given a free pass by law enforcement and the Abbey at that time, so he continued. The file shows that he was also allowed to travel freely and allowed to travel freely until he was removed from the priesthood, they call it laitization, till 2011. He also, in this file, admits to reoffending at least once in 1995. This, this is the file I'm talking about. Father Tom Gillespie. Father Tom Gillespie, uh, the file shows abused a child in Stillwater in 1978. And um, I'll talk about this later, but even despite restrictions, seem to continue to have or initiate some contact with kids. And how many uh, kids he has abused, we do not know, but we knew, know that he posed a serious peril um, um, for many years. The fifth is Father Richard Eckroth. Eckroth is a name that we have discussed and made public many times before. But what the Eckroth file shows us uh, and you is that he brought kids with him to the St. John's cabin called the Cabin Kids. A list he prepared and there are not just dozens, but there are literally hundreds of kids that were brought to that cabin by Ekroth. And that happened for years without any supervision, and the file shows that. It also shows that he admitted getting and giving massages to kids while naked in the sauna there. And despite a parent's report to the abbot in 1982, St. John's did nothing about Eckroth until being sued when we sued St. John's in the early 1990s. They put him on a restriction then, but they allowed him to return to the Bahamas in 1997 where he ministered in the Bahamas. So how many kids are there in the Bahamas that he was allowed access to? How many?
So what the files show us is a culture of permissive access by known offenders that don't go back just 30 or 40 years, uh, but go back 30 and 40 years, and in some ways, to the present. Now, I want to also draw attention to some other aspects of these files. And going back to Fran Hefkin for a moment. Um, Fran Hefkin, the file shows that in 2004, he was given a payment by the abbot uh, of, of $28,000. It also shows that in 2011, uh, do we have the do we have the check of uh, the 20? There's a twenty-eight thousand dollar check. We also uh, see in this file that in 2011, there's a request made of him that if he would voluntarily seek to be removed from the priesthood the abbot and the abbey would pay him $30,000. And the file shows that he received a, another check for $30,000. Uh, they note that it make it, they're gonna make it a gift so it's not taxable. But the troubling thing, of course, is that they're paying the offender more money to keep quiet and quietly walk away than they ever would any of the survivors that were coming forward before the statute of limitations was lifted. Hush money. Now, this is troubling because it's the same program that we saw in the Archdiocese, the St. Paul Minneapolis documents that we've been releasing for over a year now. Paying offenders to be quiet, to keep quiet, and walk away quietly. And um, if we look at um, Exhibit 400, that's what this Let's, no, no, let's go to this one. Um, I, I think I covered that. Um, this, this exhibit comes from the Hefkin file also. And the reason uh, we think it is of some importance is it is um, from Kevin McDonough, the then a uh, vicar general of the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis. It is to um, uh, the Villa Maria Center. And at the middle of it, he is writing, your October 2nd letter indicates that a number of lay people will participate in the gathering. General promotional materials that would be widely distributed Keep in mind, this offender is on restriction. He's a known child abuser. And McDonough writes, uh, as reflected in a file, that general promotional materials that would be widely distributed, for example, in parishes of the archdiocese, including Hastings, that's where he abused a kid from 1989 to 1992, um, and which would announce Father Hefkin's participation by prompt more of the press and the public attention that nobody wants to bring back down on him. I am deliberately being vague in this regard 
but I simply ask you to exercise good judgment in your promotional materials. In other words, take his name out of the, out of the public view, allow him to do his thing, but keep it quiet. Don't make it public. This becomes particularly disturbing when we look at the recent history of Fran Hefkin. He was prosecuted in Hastings last year for the sexual abuse of a minor who was then the age of 10 to 13 while being a, a, a monk and a priest at a parish in Hastings. He was acquitted. The jury found him not guilty of criminal sexual conduct. And the reason is, is that the jury only heard the testimony of the kid, who's now in his 30s. And he was standing alone, one voice, before that jury. And they weren't allowed to hear or know what the abbot and the abbey and what is shown in these files that he had admitted abusing in 1984, that we had brought two civil cases in advance of that criminal trial, where there are two other victims ready and willing and able to testify, and that this file was not fully made known or disclosed, we believe, to uh, the prosecutor and certainly known to the jury. So he walked again. He walked in 1984 when they gave him a pass and allowed to continue in ministry, and he walked again. We also have concerns about the safety plan, and they have put these offenders on restrictions, and those that are alive, and they they call it a safety plan. And I think the file reflects some of those concerns and I think it should be shared. And um, um, there is um, concerning Finian McDonald, for example, the guy who claims to have had 200 sexual partners. Um, the abbot says there's reports of several different incidents where there are possible violations of the safety plan. Yeah, an incident in 2009, an incident in 2011, and then another one, a third one, in 2012. All of which give rise to serious concerns about not the past, but the present and the current safety plan. We raise this because it concerns us. Tom Gillespie also on restriction under a safety plan. There's a complaint from a student in 2013 uh, where he is emailing the student and the Abbott Clausen says, stop, you can see how sensitive this student is. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He's on restriction? in contact with students. Similar concerns with Bruce Wolmering. Now Bruce Wolmering is deceased now, but the file reflects, um, and we cite in our materials, the pages here, but in August of 2006, Wolmering is sending unwanted, explicit emails to a former student, and that student complains, while he's on restrictions or on the safety plan. So we say and share this because it causes concern. And these are concerns that aren't just about what happened 30 and 40, and 20 and 10 years ago, these are concerns about now and in real time.
So they're real, and they're in these files. We also find in the file of Finian McDonald some concerning um, some concerning communication uh, from the Vatican. Finian McDonald complains that the abbot and St. John's are releasing information to us and giving that information to the review board for consideration. And so Finian McDonald complains to the Vatican. And let's show the first page, and there's the first page, and at the conclusion, uh, it, it is written by representatives of the Vatican to the abbot. This is from the Archbishop Secretary to the Holy See. He says, Father McDonald's right to privacy was violated in the handing over of his file to the external review board without his consent. In the future, no information contained in a monk's file is to be released to third parties without the express permission of the monk in question. While it might be both to his benefit and to that of the Abbey to participate in a program such as Project, Project Pathfinders, no monk can be required to do so under obedience. So what we see in this document is the current attitude of the Vatican enforcing a rule of obedience and silence and imposing it on the abbot and the abbey who we believe in releasing these files and sharing them with the review board are doing the right thing because it's designed to protect kids and not the offenders. So that is a reflection of something that's coming from the Vatican that um, is of concern uh, uh, to us. So, here we are. Five files on five offenders who have now been released because of the courage of Troy and his will and his desire to make sure that the truth is known. Is the full truth known? Far from it. Is this the beginning? Yes. Is it alarming? Certainly. And is the clock ticking? It is. And when I say the clock is ticking, there is yet but six months yet for survivors to find their voice, share their secret, and come forward and do something like Troy did. And they don't have to use their name and can remain private and non-public. Troy chose to be public. Troy chose to, chose to speak up and speak out because it has been and remains your desire to do what you can to protect others and, and help clean this up. And it's because of you, Troy, and the other survivors with whom you stand and speak that we're able to get some of this information out. So thank you for that. Mike? I first heard about Troy back before the statute was passed. I mean, Troy had no case back then. Um, the statute of limitations was gone. The statute passed and he had three years in order to come forward. During those three years, we brought the claim for him. Um, one of the first things they did when we brought the claim was they came out with the 19 names. They'd come out with some of the names before, but they confirmed the 19 names. Part of the settlement, no matter what, Troy kept telling us, I, we, they've got to produce the files. Some of those files are here, okay? Stuff keeps coming out. There are people that are associated with those files. These aren't just historical documents. These are people that are abused. There are kids that are abused, people that are hurt, that need to come forward. They got six more months. If they come forward in those six months, they've got a chance to add to Troy's voice. They got a chance to, mean, to give some value, give some meaning to those files. Um, 
every wave of more stuff that comes out, it, it, they talk about it, that being it. But if people come forward, they come forward with their stories, they have the right to tell what to ha took place for them, we'll get more information, we'll get more, uh, more things out there, and we'll be able to help people. Um, with six months left, the time is now to come forward. Uh, Troy did. Troy made a difference. He's made an incredible difference, but it shouldn't stop here. And the way we give more value to what Troy did is to have those people come forward. Got until May. That's what we're asking for. You need to call. You need to get the help. And it's the opportunity's there. Troy, I want to. I want you to express anything else that you want to have heard, uh, either about what you're feeling or about how you feel. Um, uh, your efforts are being um, um, responded to. Well, um, came down, I had a whole different message. My message has always been, it's about the people that haven't come forward and their families because it affects all of them. And it affects their kids, their grandkids, their, their parents, their brothers and sisters. So all the way along it's been Come forward. You've got a voice. Be John Doe. Be Jane Doe. Be whatever you're comfortable with. Go to whoever you think will help you, whether that's these gentlemen or somebody else. But make your story known. We were lucky enough to get 19 files, and if you read the letter from uh, St. John's that came out a couple of days ago, uh, I had flames coming out of my ears last night. Um, one of the things they talked about were these cases are 20 and 30 and 40 years old, which we've just shown that they're still happening. Um, but my big question is, if it happened 20 years ago, does that make it less valuable? Does that person that had that happen 20 years ago, they, they don't have any value anymore? Because, you know, Biden happened in 1977. So technically, since it happened a long time ago, I don't, I don't have a reason to even be up here talking in their eyes. The second thing that they said is that we're going to twist the information that is coming out, uh, both Jeff and Mike. And what we're going to do, I believe, is put the whole folder out, the whole file. You guys get to look at it, and you guys get to see what's in there, and you can make your own choices. So that way, we can't twist it for the way we want it. That's their job, to twist it around. The other thing is they've been saying that they have gone out of their way to make these folders and files public since, I believe, the 90s. Um, and it, that would be nice. Um, that is not the case. I, we fought very hard. One of the big things that I wanted was it's got to come out in the light. We, we want to know what they know, when they knew it, and we got to get help for the people that haven't gotten it yet. Well, in our fight, we got 19 folders. I believe there's a lot more folders that are out there. Hopefully we can get more of them. And we need some of those survivors to come forward and tell their story so that we can go after some more of those files. Because as soon as it's out, then we'll know everything. And we won't have to do this every month or two. You won't have to see me coming up and saying hi. Um, that's what they say they're doing. Open the doors and let us come in and see the files. And back to the survivors. Remember, May 15th, May 20, 25th, one of those. Is your last chance to come forward and talk. You need to do that for yourself. Um, and that's pretty much it for me for the day. And uh, Troy, uh, thank you. Uh, and I think it needs to be said that this isn't just about time and the six months that there is for survivors to come forward and share their secret. It's about the truth, the painful truth, some of which is reflected in these files, and we pledge to you more are coming and more are coming out, and this is just the beginning, and we're working on that as we speak. 
but it's also about hope. It's about the hope of the survivors who know they can share their secret in safety, but at the same time do something like Troy has done, but do it privately, knowing that they can get help, they can have hope, they can get healing, and they can be a part of doing something to protect other kids in making sure the truth becomes known as painful as it is and as ugly as it is reflected in files like this. So it is time. And there is hope because of the courage of the survivors and the chance that the survivors have been given for a voice to make the truth known through the Child Victims Act here in Minnesota. And because of that act, survivors are given power and hope and a chance at healing they have never had. And so it is now time for truth, for hope, and for healing. And to you, Troy, and all the survivors that have come forward and who have found their voice and are a part of this journey, we express deep gratitude. Because without you, we can't do anything. And none of this truth, as painful as it is, could ever have been known or ever will be.